Okay, well, good morning, and let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time we have together to study your word, and we are thankful for the blessings that we receive each morning as we open your word together. We invite your Holy Spirit to continue to direct and guide us, to correct us, and to set our feet upon the correct path. And we ask that you can be close to each person in their individual struggles. We're thankful, Lord, for this light, but we need your help in understanding it. And so we pray that you can help us now be with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so yesterday we we got a little bit sidetracked. So part of it was my one computer wasn't working. It was just the internet somehow. I rebooted it and it worked. But I've never had the internet only work for one computer and not another. So that was kind of strange. But it did bring us off a little bit in our study because I didn't have some of the things I wanted to look at. I couldn't. And now where we ended up, and, and we're probably going to have to backtrack a little bit, but I'm just going to start where we ended. So we were discussing uh, uh, the story in 1 Kings chapter 13. And the reason that we were there is we have these symbols of of the Republican Party and, and um of the Democratic Party and a symbol that we have for Trump. So we know that a lion um, represents Judah. And in Stephen's diagram, he aligned uh, Xerxes, Trump, and Judah. And we have in 1870, uh, uh, Nast is the guy's name, uh, Thomas Nast, I believe who was a cartoonist, a political cartoonist, and he has this donkey kicking a dead lion. And so this lion and the, and, and the donkey reminded me of uh, 1 Kings chapter 13, when you have this disobedient prophet. And, and first you're going to have this prophet who deceives him uh, because he's after he gives the prophecy of Josiah, which we connect to the July 18, 2020 prediction. At least that's our understanding of it. So after he delivers that, he's not supposed to go the way that he came, but supposed to go another way, and he's not supposed to stop. But a prophet, an old prophet, um, comes and deceives him and tells him that he had a message from God that he's supposed to come and eat with him. And, of course, that wasn't the case, <clears throat> and and the God and God speaks to them when they sat at table, and and then he's going to um, get on this ass. So they, they they saddle him an ass. He travels, and a lion's going to meet him and kill him, and so. When the, the prophet who had done the deceiving, uh, he goes and, he, well, he hears of what had happened. So he goes and he takes the body of this uh, uh, disobedient prophet and buries him in his own tomb. Now, when he gets there, he sees uh, the lion and the ass and the carcass of the prophet, and the lion's not tearing the, the ass or um, uh, eating the prophet, the carcass. So in trying to understand the symbols here, one of the things that um, you would have to look at is 2 Kings chapter 23. So in 2 Kings chapter 23, we're going to have the fulfillment of this prophecy. Um, and this is when Josiah, so this starts at verse 15, moreover the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made, both that altar and the high place he broke down and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. 
And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchres that were in the mount, and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchres, and burned them upon the altar, and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. Then he said, What title is that that I see? And the men of the city told him, It is the sepulchre of the man of God, which came from Judah, and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, Let him alone, that no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet that came from Samaria. So, so obviously the prophet who came from Samaria, he's going to be in that tomb as well, in that grave. So what does this all mean <laughs> is, is the question. So maybe people had time to think about it since yesterday. But we have this prophecy, the prophecy of Josiah. But we also have this fulfillment of it. And on the fact that the bones are going to be left alone by Josiah. No ideas, anyone? What should we say that bones symbolically represent? Now, that was one of the questions that I had. Now, we know we have bones in Ezekiel chapter 37. Right. All right, so we have the Valley of Dry Bones. And remember, these bones are going to be brought together. And, you know, and then you're going to have the sinews laid upon them, and then the skin's going to cover them, and then God's spirit is going to be pro uh, prophesied, so prophesy unto the wind, and, and that God's breath is going to come into them, so the breath from the four winds, that they may live. And this is going to be the exceeding great army. And we know symbolically this represents um, uh, a number of things. It can refer to the resurrection of, of the dead, of the righteous, but it usually refers to uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in the last days. But when it comes to the bones themselves, and this, what what this reminds me of. So, one of the um, analogies we have made with line upon line is it is like a those transparencies in a medical anatomy book, right? Okay. So you take, you know, you have the skeleton, right? And then you, you know, it'll put like the organs and it'll put the, the muscles and the nervous system and you lay these down and then finally, you know, you, you have a, a human being, right? Um, so can these refer to this message being put together bit by bit until the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Okay, so if we take that a second step, is this the structure of the message being assembled bit by bit? Yes. Well, we know that that's the case. We know that as we lay down these lines, as, this, as we pass through the fulfillment of prophecy, we have a greater understanding of what it is we're experiencing. And... Now, all of these bits, all of these little details that we have are not our message, right? I mean, this okay. is not the message. We're, we're not going to be going through everything we've learned and, you know, and all these stuff dealing with all these birthdays and all, all these things to present a message to the world. I mean, it wouldn't mean anything to them. But we do have to have a message. And we do have to have a people that can represent that message. So, so as it's being assembled, as these truths are coming together, when you finally see the, the picture, it's a whole picture. 
You don't see all the sinews and the nerves and the bones. You see a living person. In this case, a bunch of living people um, that have God's spirit. So if we're going to deal with the bones themselves, what would we what would be the analogy of a of this of the bone structure of a human being compared to this message? I thought you were almost answering your own question there. <laughs> yeah, I know. Almost. Well, I mean, when you're saying a bone structure, you're you're basically addressing the support on which everything else hangs. Right. So like a foundation. Right. Right. So the bones would represent the foundation of this message, wouldn't they? Would we say the foundation or the pillar? Well, I would say the foundation. It's the foundational structure. Um, because the pillars are truths. Um, like the essential truths. I always think of the pillars as the main doctrines. Upon which the foundation, they're built upon the foundation. So is it your thought that if this is the foundation, that these bones are the equivalent of the seven times of Leviticus 26? Well, the prophetic periods. Okay. Right. So, so if we look at the bones, right, we, we have these, because we're dealing with the bones of, of this prophet. So this is the prophecy of Josiah, and the prophecy is pro proclaimed, but the prophecy ends up um, being rejected by Jeroboam, but it's going to be fulfilled uh, by Josiah, right? Now, we have the problem that I'm having still is with understanding the prophet, the old prophet who comes from Samaria, who deceives the disobedient prophet. Now, now what does Samaria represent? In our understanding of how we've used Samaria. Those that understand <clears throat> some of the truths, but not all, have not accepted all of them. Well, don't we... Don't we usually have it as Protestantism, apostate Protestantism, as a man put there in the chat? You can have it there too. Yeah. Okay. Right. So apostate Protestantism. And one of the things that we have said is that Parminder had been using basically papal uh, ideas. So, so we don't usually look at him as being Protestant or apostate Protestant. I mean, the basic idea is that that he is is papal, but but the Protestants are papal too, right? Because the method of study that the Protestants adopted basically was this scientific method of study that was developed by the papacy. Correct? No disagreement. Okay. So, so if we're going to deal with this disobedient prophet, so if we go back to uh, 1 Kings 13. So we know this prophecy is given, the prophecy of Josiah. And then we have this old prophet in Bethel. So he's in the house of God. 
And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. So why are the sons coming and telling him? Who are the sons? Because they're conveying a message to this old prophet. The, uh, those who attended the school of the prophets were sometimes called uh, the sons of the prophet. Okay. Well, so, so it's possible that they're not his actual sons, but at least symbolically they could represent uh, the sons of the prophet or the people who attended the school of the prophets. Yeah, I take it that this is actually his sons, or maybe they could maybe represent the sons of the prophets with right. those who attended the school. Yeah, just as a symbolic sense. So even if it's his literal sons, we can still take it as a symbol. Okay, so he says unto his son, saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass and he rode thereon. Now, we would take this as... A symbol of Islam in this case or are we going to look at this have, having to do with the Democrats as a symbol that is Issachar either can fit the situation that we've got here if we're going to if we're going to place this <clears throat> as a symbol of Issachar, then we're going to have to look at this just with, with a little different viewpoint, because then who is the prophet that is reliant upon Issachar? Yeah, I see what you're saying. I don't know. I mean, see, the thing is, I don't know who this disobedient prophet represents or what he represents specifically, because he does deliver the message of July 18th. So it must be the movement, right? It's got to be FFA. I could see that as FFA, yeah. Now, he's FFA is deceived by Parminder's message. But we also have those that are being deceived by the use of literal and not figurative. Okay. But that's still part of Parminder's message. Parminder's message was more of a twisting. Yeah, I, I agree. But there was a mixture of literal and spiritual. But if you're going to twist the two, literal and spiritual, yeah. you're going to have confusion coming up because you're not seeing a correct application of one or the other mm -hmm. but my, my point kind of is the fact that we we're trying to take our lines as the actual lines instead of understanding them as as symbolic So, so however we want to look at it, we know that um, if we say that he saddled the ass, we can say that this is the message of Islam. So was Parminder using the message of Islam? Was his message tied to Islam?
Parminder's message was no different than the um, the application with Balaam. Okay, right. And remember, we also have the rebellion at Baal Peor connected with Balaam, right? Agreed. And and that's going to be Parminder's message. Well, so, as, as we look at this, Baal Peor became a type of false worship, right? Well, it's a mixture of church and state. It's an unholy union. Right. Uh, there's all kinds of things. that. But what, what I'm looking at is within Parminder's message, his choice was to tell people to set aside the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. You set aside the health message because he's making a an open declaration mm -hmm. regarding how the sisters were to dress. Yeah. But he's also setting aside the spirit of prophecy by telling them that moving to the country is no longer important. You must move back to the cities in order to evangelize. Mm -hmm. So in, in both cases, his decision in twisting much of what goes on and much of what had been said throughout the spirit of prophecy is to make of none effect those words of warning. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have this message of, of the old prophet, and it's a message that's going to deceive. And it's going to find the man of God sitting under an oak, which we would connect to Nashville. Correct? No disagreement. Okay. So, so this would be, so we're going to see that this message all continues, but it's going to be after or at some point connected with this Nashville prediction that this man of God is going to be deceived. Now, this is not a person, right? We would attach this to FFA that gives this message. But if he's going to invite him to come home and eat bread, what does that imply? A place to lodge? Well, it's a message, right? If you're going to eat, right? And and because he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said, to me by the word of the Lord, thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. So, so if we're taking that this prophet who is deceived is this movement or a part of this movement, deceived by a message, it's because they have been disobedient. Yeah, both prophecies, prophets are messages. Maybe that's what Iran is saying. But they're messages of different groups within this movement. Okay. So, so we can see that there's a message that's being eaten that's not supposed to be eaten. But then he's going to give this message. He said unto him, I am a prophet, also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. 
And we know this has to be the message of Parminder. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. So the Lord's going to speak to who in this case? It's going to be the disobedient prophet, or not the dis, uh, or the deceptive prophet. Pardon me, and he's going to give a message to the disobedient prophet. He cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, "Thus saith the Lord: For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, um, but camest back and hast eaten bread and drank water, drunk water in the place of which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water." Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulchre of thy fathers. Now, so in looking at this, I, I think, you know, we must be interpreting this incorrectly at, 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 on some level. Now, okay, what if we said that the prophet who came from Samaria um, represents, because we have Judah and Samaria. So let's let's go back here and look at this, because... I mean, this isn't directly Judges chapter 4 and 5. This is 1 Kings chapter 13. And has there been a message? Um, have, have people moved away from this message after July 18th? I mean... Quite a few. Yeah, so, so what if we don't say that... The, what if we say that instead of this being the message of Parminder or Parminder really being directly addressed here as the one who deceives, um, couldn't it just be a message of some other kind of message that's affecting this movement that's represented by Samaria? Because Parminder seems to more represent the papacy and the papal spirit. Could this represent the history of this movement in connection with the July 18th prediction as far as after Parminder's gone? Maybe that's a better way to look at it. Yeah, that would be a better way of looking at it. Okay. So, because remember in Second Chronicles chapter 29 and 30, we're going to have this message that's going to be given to invite uh, northern Israel to this second Passover, right? So this is in the time of uh, Hezekiah. Now, in the time of Hezekiah, as much as long after this time, but that message is going to be in relationship uh, to how do we understand Second Chronicles chapter twenty nine? We have the eight days that they cleanse the the most holy place, and eight days that they cleanse the holy place. So how, what is Samar what is the prophet from Samaria then probably representing? So this old prophet in Bethel. Could this represent Adventism even? Well, if you looked at the the Hebrew as you as you've done in the past. Yeah. The old prophet would be how, how do we pronounce this? Akkad? Uh, okay. A first, a like, a certain. So, well, so yeah. It, well, it means something that's united as one. And wasn't the 
what was it really the majority of the Adventist church united as one against the message of July 18th? Yeah. So if we looked at the old prophet being that of Adventism. Okay. And the disobedient prophet being future for America. Would that make more sense? That would make more sense. Um, okay, because one of the things that's going to happen, so, um, so when we go, when we go later, so we have this sepulcher, right, that he's going to, or his grave, that he's going to place the bones of the man of God in. Now, can that represent the death of FFA and it's basically placed in the same grave that Adventism is going to be placed in? I think that's logical. Okay, because as I've struggled with this, I mean, this is the only way, because I've tried to fit this the one way and it doesn't seem to work. Uh, and, and the other thing that we ran into, so we know that um, this old prophet, the prophet that came from Samaria, um, he believes in the end that this, um, that this prophecy is going to come to pass, at least in some way. Because uh, in verse 32, for the saying which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the city of Samaria shall surely come to pass. So, so this old prophet is going to come to recognize this prophecy. Now, and, and then if we go back to verse 28, I know we're jumping around all over the place here. Um, okay, if we even go back to 26. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof regarding this lion standing by the carcass, and he said, it is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion which hath torn him and slain him. So who does the lion represent? What does it represent? What kind of symbol? In the context of which we've been applying this. It's a destructive symbol, but is it a destructive message? Okay, well, we have the line connected with Trump here, right? And we have the, the donkey connected with the Democrats. I don't disagree with that. No, I took I took a look at the cartoon that you were referring to. Yeah. It was interesting for me because of course they they labeled the lion as Edwin Stanton. Yeah. But the donkey was labeled as Copperheads. Yeah, and Copperheads is Peace Democrats. Peace Democrats. What does that mean? What's the well, <clears throat> okay, the historic application. When, when the Civil War began, you had a group of Democrats that lived in the North that sought peace with those that lived in the South. There were some a limited few Democrats that wanted to see the abolition of slavery. 
Okay. Now, it's interesting because Edwin Stanton was initially a Democrat at the time of Lincoln's election. He was a Democrat. He did not become a Republican until two years into the Civil War, till 1862. Okay, so in 1860, he's a Democrat. Correct. Okay, And in 1860, we have the symbol of the elephant first being reply, uh, applied to uh, the Republicans. Correct. So we have that 186 symbol. Now, Thomas Nast was, was pretty direct about a lot of situations. There were a lot of his cartoons that I looked at briefly before this message, before this, this study today. Yeah. Now, Nast had a cartoon that he did in 1873 regarding the panic of 1873, because again, you have an economic collapse coming. Mm -hmm. but it shows a Democrat smoking a pipe. And from that pipe is coming the great bubble of inflation. Mm. Now, in these situations, Nast, who was very much a liberal of his day, had a viewpoint that was fairly direct as to how he saw things going with the different parties. Now, here in this portion of scripture, in 1 Kings 13, we're dealing with this where there's a lion that is tearing the disobedient prophet. Yeah. Our question today is what is it that is tearing apart this disobedient prophet? Well, it'd be the message about Trump. Because we're dealing with a message that is not a uniting message it's a message that is a dividing message mm -hmm. so the lion being another message then what is the ass that is let alone well, this to me would still have to be the message because I look at the line as and the ass as the message of Trump and the message of July 18th. Okay. Right. So the last president, because these were the two messages really attached to um, our, our second angel's message, if you want to put it that way. Like in Millerite history, they had two messages. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, and Babylon is fallen, is fallen. They had two messages. And, and this movement has had two messages. The last president and July 18th. But what did we tie the message of July 18th to? Well, we tied it to Islam. Agreed. Yeah. And that's really the point that I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Go ahead. But there is this symbol. This, this symbol can have more than one meaning. And it also represents the Democrats as well. Because when it came to what we looked at at Raphael was what it was going to be. Um, it was going to have Islam involved with it initially. And then it was about the king of the north and the king of the south. It was going to be about uh, Russia conquering um, the United States. That was going to be the Battle of Raffia. Now, it ended up being the Democrats conquering uh, Trump on January 6th. But in some ways, those things are tied together. I mean, Russia is in some ways tied to Islam. But it's, but it's not. But it wasn't Russia. Instead, we have um, 
the New World Order, the, the globalists winning this battle with the Democrats, you know, conquering Trump on January 6th. So, so this, these symbols are layered down upon each other, but they're, but they're all typical of something that's going to come. But as far as what's happened in this movement, um, the, it, you know, it says that the lion is not going to eat the carcass and it's not going to tear the ass. So what does that mean? That it kills the, the disobedient prophet but does not tear the ass? What does yeah. that mean? Yeah. Symbolically, I think we'd have to look at this that it creates the end of the disobedient prophet, which we're saying would be future for America, but it would leave the message of Islam, the ass, alone. Right. Because that hasn't been attacked at this point. No, it hasn't. I mean, and, and, and at least in the movement. So, I mean, we, we're not addressing it all that much. But, I mean, we still accept July 18th and the symbolism of it. But we just think that, you know, this is going to happen in the future still. So, um, now, one of the things that led to all this, though, has to go back to um, what we were looking at initially was Samuel Snow's um, birth in 19, or 1906, 1806, 1806, and it's a symbol of 186. And then we have um, in the we have the 1870 um, uh, census, the federal census, where we get the records of of snow and, and his family i guess i'm not sure specifically what we get in that census and and then we have in the prophetic faith of our fathers we have Froome saying that he died in 1870 which is incorrect but it does at least tie the symbol of 186 and 187 together which are both the same symbol we understand that now it's interesting that um Biden is born 186 weeks before Trump. So that's 1,302 days between their births. And then if we go, so that means from Biden, which is, uh, when's his birthday again? Um, so he's born on November 20th. 1942 and it's 186 weeks to Trump's birthday on June 14th 1946 and if we go to January 6 2021 and we count backwards 186 weeks it brings us to Trump's 71st birthday So I'll do it this way, just so you can see this. So here you have uh, Biden's birthday, Trump's birthday, his birth, right? And the 302 days, which is 186 weeks. 1,302, not 302. Yeah, one th uh, yeah 1,302 days. And then you have uh, 71 years later, um, Trump's birthday after he had become uh, president, that is when he was 
Um, his inauguration, he was 70 years, seven months, and seven days old. Right, so we have that, that symbol. And this is going to be, so if I just put this in here, I'm just going to put this January 20th date in here. <clears throat> um, yeah, so it's going to be 145 days after his inauguration that he turned 71. So that's, um, there's something about this number I can't remember. But anyway, now the number of days between his birthday, for his birth to his 71st birthday is 25,933. Now, the number of parts in a Hebrew day is 25,920. This is 13 difference than that. Now, we know that this can be the symbol of the number of parts in a day plus 13. Now, 13 days is 18,720 minutes. So, so there is a symbol there. But it's, it's like a mirror. You have Biden's birth, Trump's birth. Then you have Trump turning 71, and then 186 weeks later, you have basically Biden defeating Trump at uh, you know the siege of Washington. So the point that I have here is these symbols of 186 or 187 uh, tying together Biden and Trump. But they're tying this to this to this message. So what particularly does this mean? Uh, we have, remember, the elephant and the do donkey. 1860, that's where we get the elephant being as a symbol of the Republicans. And 1870, the donkey being the symbol of the Democrats. So why is this? What What is being shown here? And then we have this lion here and the donkey, so the lion representing Trump, or the message regarding Trump. Okay, any more thoughts? I'm still piecing some of this together. Well, me too. I mean, I've looked at this a lot over the last few years because I knew it had something to do with this message, but I could never really put it together. It didn't really make much sense to me that you, you know, especially back in, let's say, uh, 2019 when I'm looking at this, and I see that there's message, the message of Josiah, and then the prophet who gives that message is going to be disobedient. He's going to be deceived and led astray. So I didn't know what that would mean. But now we're tying this to this message that's being given regarding Trump being reelected. And that message is going to tear. Has torn has torn it's it's destroyed it's killed um this other message the one who the prophet who gave this message which is ffa and we can see that ffa doesn't exist anymore just uh the movement still exists but in a fractured state i mean we could say it's a carcass i guess but then we're going to have the one who did the deceiving. So the, if the one that did this deceiving or that led it astray is the teachings of Adventism, and we know that many of the people who ended up rejecting the July 18th, where have they gone? 
Have they gone back to the Adventist church? Not all of them. Some of them, right? Right. So some of them have just gone back to some kind of Adventism. Um, they basically repudiated this, this message. They've rejected it. But then it says, the old prophet came to the city to mourn and bury him, right? So he laid his carcass in his own grave, and they mourned over him, saying, alas, my brother. Now, alas is woe, right? I would say, yeah. Okay. And it came to pass after he had buried him that he spake to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the sepulchre wherein the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. Now, we're saying that the bones represent a message, a foundational message, right? A message, a structure, yeah. Right. So are is the bones of the old prophet from Samaria, is it the foundation, if this is Adventism, does it have the same foundation as the man of God that it deceived? No. Well, shouldn't it have, though? If you go back to the foundation of Adventism, wasn't it the same foundation that we've gone back to? Technically, it should, yes, but no. Okay, so if he says, lay my bones beside his bones, what is it he's saying? Because he's going to accept this message. For the same which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places, which are in the cities of Samaria, shall surely come to pass. So does Adventism or people within Adventism eventually accept this message? It would almost have to be. Yeah. And we know the bones of the false prophets are going to be burned by Josiah, but not the bones of the man of God or of the, the prophet who deceived him, the old prophet. Josiah is going to leave their bones alone. Okay. Well, for now, I, I think that's all I can do with this. That is, I don't think I know enough yet to, to say more than I've said. I mean, we've examined it. I know. Does anybody have any other thoughts? I think in the picture <clears throat> that you're presenting that this is giving us a, a good outline for us to fill out. But I still think we're, we're missing some, maybe we're missing the history as it unfolds in this movement. That we oh, don't no, we're definitely missing, we're definitely missing pieces. Yeah. And it could be just they're the pieces that we haven't passed through yet. Now, um, another point I want to address just dealing with, with this is um, one, of, one of the things I was looking at. So I'm, I'm going to ch share a different screen here. I do want to get back to judges, but I want to show people this um, again. So this is my Excel spreadsheet where I have these different tribes. Okay. So the top one here is going to be um, in numbers one and two. You see the names of the tribes, and then you're going to see um, the numbering of those tribes, and then this sort of um, chart that 
compares the different spans of time, or the numbers, I guess, but we take them as spans of time, between the different tribes. So the difference between Simeon and Reuben is 12,800, right? Etc. So you got all these differences. And then we have the same thing in Numbers 26. I have the numbers of the different tribes and the, the difference between those. Now, we have these spans of time. Of course, these are, or the numbering of these tribes, that can represent spans of time. And, and we've already used a number of them. And um, we've used, we used um, Reuben, we used uh, Issachar, we used um, Zebulun, we used Naphtali, we've used Dan, and, and there's other ones that we could use as well. Um, I think actually I've, I've used some of them, I just can't remember all the ones that I've used. And, and we had an interesting one dealing with um, uh, Reuben that was, we could count from uh, November 4th, 1888, uh, to Parminder's baptism, not baptism, um, his uh, ordination on February 27th, uh, 2016. And then we could also count from the rebellion on August 29th, 2019, um, 465 days, and that led us to, um, I'm trying to remember where that led us to. That was December 6th. Yeah, December 6th, 2020. So that led us to the declaration. So it tied together uh, Parminder's rebellion with the declaration of December 6th, 2020. Okay, but I'm I'm doing a quick cross reference in what you've got here on numbers one to two. Yeah. If you crossed row four with column G, so Judah with Issachar. Okay. Yeah. So Judah with Issachar. Either way, I could go. But yeah. So it's twenty two hundred. Yeah. Would that be a symbol of 2020? Okay. Well, I would think so. I would take it as a symbol of 2020. Now, as far as the span of time, um, it ends up being, um, I think it's 55 years. Um, Yeah, so it's 65, 55 years and 111 days. So I, I don't know where that would fit in, but. So I, haven't, I, I mean, I noticed it this morning. I was looking because I was thinking if you if you are matching Judah and Issachar, that's what you're kind of thinking of. Well, as we were going back over this, you bring up the Thomas Nass cartoon. Yeah. Lion of the tribe of Judah. Yeah. And then we have, of course, Issachar, and the symbol of Issachar is the the ass that is bowed between two burdens. Right. So it's going to be in 2020. Do you have um, Democrats kicking Trump as he dies? I see it as them kicking at. Okay. Trump. I mean, did you? Were you ever able to bring up the the entire cartoon? Um, yeah, I've seen the cartoon. Um, let me see. Yeah, I mean, I've see. I've saved it onto onto a thumb drive, and I can save it if you want, or I yeah, can share. Um, 
yeah, I mean, I think I just saw it on Wikipedia. Um, but um, here, let me share screen for just a second. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. There you go. You can share it. I'm going to pull up several real quick. Different cartoons? Yeah. Are these cartoons dated? Some are. Okay, so let's see what I can do. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Maybe I can't bring this up the way I thought. So it's just a diagram? What is it you got? Well, I was bringing up several things, so it doesn't look like it wants me to be able to bring up. I'm going to try this one more time. Apparently, I have to save this in a different manner. My apology. Okay. Yeah, so it was um, January 15th, 1870, I believe. Okay. Harper's Weekly. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm looking at a couple of different ones right now. I'll see what I can do to have these have these ready for tomorrow. So, yeah. so we're going to have to look at those tomorrow. Right. Now, so, so let's go back to um, judges. Okay. Because uh, we're. Um, So the reason that we got to this whole issue of was because of Issachar. So we were counting out these different uh, spans of time. Right. Come from these different tribes. And, and so Issachar led us to this uh, connection. Um, and uh, the span of time, the drawing that Stephen had, had um, was I'm just going to go back to that drawing. Um, so this was the drawing of the tribe of Issachar from Numbers 2625, which was 64,300 days, going from the Great Disappointment to Joe Biden's being announced as winner of the election on November 7th, 2020, that this happened to be uh, Jeff Pippinger's uh, birthday, his 69th birthday, which is, if we go back to the election itself, it's 25,200 days from Jeff's birth uh, to the election, if you count it um, inclusively. So, so on the day that Biden was elected, Jeff was 25,200 days old. 
That would be the 25,200th day of his life. So would that be significant? Yes. Okay. And then it's going to be three days later, or four days, depending how you count it, um, that you're going to have Biden an announced as the winner. Okay, so that's going to be Jeff's 69th birthday. So, so Jeff is tied to this um, failure, and put in quotation marks, of the Trump prophecy. But by a symbol, that's a 2520 symbol. And then the 69-year symbol is a symbol of the 69 weeks leading up to the final week. Okay. Okay. So that's just one uh, point to note. Now, so that's what we were doing with Issachar. We were looking at that, that one symbol um, of the one tribe. But we also notice that if Issachar is mentioned twice. That is, the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barak. Now, does that mean Issachar and Barak are with Deborah? Is that what it's trying to say? Or is they saying Issachar is also with Barak? Why wouldn't it be Issachar is also with Barak? Well, I don't know. I'm just trying to read the grammar. The princes of Issachar with, with Jebra, even Issachar, and also Barak. So it's it's kind of obscure even in English. Um, the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, as was Issachar, so was Barak. Into the valley they rushed forth at his feet. Among the divisions of Reuben, there were great resolves of heart. That's the Jewish Publication Society. Young's literal translation. The prince of, princes of Issachar are with Deborah. Yea, Issachar is right with Barak. Into the valley he was sent on his feet. Um, so we know that Issachar is with Deborah. And we know that, and these princes of Issachar, but it's going to say the princes in Issachar are with Deborah. Yea, Issachar is right with Barak, the youngs. Um, Also could mean rightly with Barak. But the question is, why is this car mentioned twice? Is this a doubling? Well, yeah. So it, it would definitely be a doubling, right? Okay. We don't we don't have that with the other ones. We just have it with Issachar. And then it's going to talk about the divisions of Reuben, right? Right. And so we were taking well that could and that well actually that's mentioned twice as well, um, but not in the same verse, right? It's going to mention in the next verse because it's going to say for the divisions of Reuben there were great thoughts of heart. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. So there's these two sentences, but the difference between thoughts and the difference between searchings is not a great difference. Um, they're basically the same word uh, in Hebrew. And you have gadol there. 
Now we know that this has to do with Parminder's message. We're taking Reuben as representing uh, Parminder's message. But this is a division of Reuben that is going to support um, this overthrow of Parminder. So we could take a division as those that have been divided from Reuben, right? Okay. Because these are just some of Reuben. So what would the great searchings of heart and the great thoughts of heart be? Uh, be? Because uh, in the one that's translated as thoughts, it means an enactment, a resolution, a decree, a thought. But the one that's translated as searchings means examination, enumeration, deliberation. It's the word checker, finding out, number, search. So even though they're very similar words, they're, they're only three numbers apart. One's called checker, the other one's check-ek. Um, so of all of these tribes here, Ephraim, Benjamin, Manasseh, Zebulun, Issachar, and Reuben. Uh, out, of, out of these ones, I, I haven't matched spans of time with Benjamin or Manasseh yet. At least I don't think I have. I, I might have with Benjamin somewhere. Um, and But Zebulun, Issachar, and Reuben we have. And also with Ephraim, I know I did something on that. I just don't remember what. And then... Uh, then you're going to have Dan, which we already did connect spans to, and Asher, which I've already connected a span to, and Zebulun and Naphtali. Oh, Zebulun's mentioned again here at the end. So, so I guess we have three of them that are mentioned twice, but only Issachar in the one verse twice, in in what we would call a doubling, just mentioned basically. Um, right after the other one. Um, so we're going to have to put these all on a line and try to see what kind of structure. I haven't had time to do that. We kept getting getting caught up in other things. So when, when we go on with this, and, and you could probably, I think, bring up your notes on Judges 5 maybe, Dwight. Okay, just a moment. Because um, there are some things we have to look at in uh, comparison. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera, which is kind of an interesting imagery. And the river Kaishan swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kaishan. O oh my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Then were the horse hooves, horse hooves broken by the means of prancings and the prancings of the mighty ones. Curse ye Moroz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to help to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Blessed above woman shall Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, be blessed. Shall she be above woman in the tent? He asked water. She gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish. She put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with the hammer she smote Sisera and smote off his head when she had pierced and stricken through his temples. At her feet he bowed, he fell, he lay down. At her feet he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell down dead. And the mother of Sisera looked out at a window and cried through the lattice, why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? Her wise ladies answered her, yea, she returned answer to herself. 
Have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey to every man a damsel or two, to Sisera a prey of diverse colors, a prey of diverse colors of needlework, of diverse colors of needlework on both sides, meet for the necks of them that take spoil? So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord. But let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might, and the land had rest forty years. So just thought I'd read that while we're getting set up here. Now, um, so where should we go back in your notes here? Well, as I scroll back through, we were dealing of course, with these, these portions here. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar. So we're seeing this, that the, the leaders of Issachar were with the spirit of prophecy. Because we've applied Deborah to that of being a spirit of prophecy, right? Mm-hmm. And also Barak, he was sent on foot into the valley. Now, why was he sent on his feet? Why was he sent on foot into the valley? What was important about the valley itself? Well, that's where the battle is. Okay. For the divisions of Reuben... There were great thoughts of heart or great impressions. Why is this important for us to know? Why was it important as well for this to be repeated in the following verse? Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleeding of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. So we have thoughts of the heart and searchings of the heart. Mm -hmm. is, is this a repeat? And if so, is it a doubling? Or is this two different statements? Well, the words are very similar. But they're, they're, they're complementary. Okay. Because um, the way that I look at this regarding um, because it's basically the same word well except in a different form so you have thoughts and in um, brown drivers big brakes when you look at this you have um, so this is um, uh, 2711, it's related to the word 2710 in Hebrew. And and it means to cut out, decree, inscribe, set, engrave, portray, govern. Um, um, to cut out, to cut in or cut upon, engrave, inscribe, to trace, mark out, engrave, inscribe. Um, of the law, so that's why it would be a decree. And then, and then you have uh, 2714, which is the one in verse uh, 16. So that word is obviously very similar, um, but it's, it's not the same word. It's just a very similar word. And, and it could be almost like uh, they choose these words that are similar uh, to draw attention to the fact that they contrast each other. This one means a search, investigation, a searching inquiry, um, or the idea to examine intimately. Um, and as Strong's adds um, to this, an enumeration, like finding out a number. So, so you have Reuben. Now, these, of course, are people that are going to be fighting on the side of Deborah and Barak, right? 
Agreed. Now, um, so it says the princess of Issachar with, with Deborah, but it says for the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. Now, I think just the general sense of this is that, that there is, now it doesn't really say what they, how they act. Um, in verse 16 it says, why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleedings of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Um, so does it tell us really what, how Reuben acts in this situation? No. It's just that they were pondering this. Right. The two different types of pondering. The one which is more a decree or an enactment, and the other which is more a searching out. Right? So you have thoughts and searchings here. Um, but it couldn't refer to number. Right? So a group that's searching out the number. So, I mean, if Reuben here does represent those who are affected by Parminder's message, maybe it's referring to those who hadn't taken the side of Parminder or searching out, but they're still somewhat sitting on the fence. Could. I don't know. I, I just find it difficult interpreting poetic language in Hebrew. It's it's not it's not as direct as their other things. Okay. So go on. We got the next verse. Maybe we can take that one. Gilead abode beyond Jordan. And why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches. So here we have an alternate where Gilead abode beyond Jordan. And why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seaport and abode in his creeks. Yeah. Yeah, I would think, yeah, because this, um, the breach is, I always understand as being the, uh, they're sheltered from the waves, but I guess where the creeks come into the sea, or the streams come into the sea. But anyway, um, so Gilead is beyond the Jordan, so that's going to be those that are to the east, right? I would say so. And then Dan remained in ships now. Uh, and Asher continued on the seashore. So that's going to be in the west. Right. Okay, so they're not going to come to the aid. Is that what they're saying? Well, is it also that they're not accepting the message? That they're they're hearing it, but they're not willing to take it in. Yeah, that's definitely possible. Okay, so we and have then, some tribes mentioned here that are going to be supportive, but also it lists the tribes that are not supportive of this. Because yeah. you've got you've got some tribes that are willing to consider this some that are not that are hearing it but just are not willing to even consider it and some that are supportive so far and then you've got zebulun and naphtali were a people that exposed to reproach their lives unto the death in the high places of the field okay so zebulun and naphtali representing a representative of those ten thousand uh troops they put their lives on the line. Yeah. Okay. And we had the 10,000 um, as a number going from 
November 9th, 1989 to um, 2027. Or 2017, pardon me. That's going to be March 27th, 2017. But we never have addressed the symbol of the 10,000. Um, well, the way that I look at it as a symbol is it, it ties us to the time of the end in this movement and to the symbol of the message to the Levites. All right. Yeah, there's lots of other things we want to consider. I mean, other numbers. I'm trying to bring some of these together, but um, but we've got quite a bit really to consider on this part of it, mm -hmm. and we have just a few minutes remaining in today's meeting. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're not getting very far yet. I mean, no. We're, we're, we're wading through stuff. We're, we're sorting through stuff, but we haven't put it together yet. Um, but I guess the, in just in closing, to sort of address what we're, we're looking at here, um, we're, we're trying to deal with all these spans of time, right? We're trying to put them in to some kind of structure to help us understand what this is talking about. That's the main thing we're doing here. And these spans of time are gonna be based upon some relationship between the numbers of these tribes. And until we get it all together, it's not we're not gonna get a clear picture. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Just a lot of things to look at. Okay. Are we, are we getting a bit worn out with all this? No, there's just, we, we've we got, it, it's like having a, a very large puzzle. And we've gotten a little bit of the framework put together, but we're still not seeing the whole picture. Yeah. And, and there's lots of little details and pieces of the puzzle we really haven't introduced in, in these studies yet, mostly because we haven't sorted through them. And, and so we're trying to present the pieces or the structure more than the pieces themselves. But we have lots of, lots of interesting things. Um, you know, dealing with Samuel Snow, uh, dealing with uh, Biden, dealing with Trump, um, dealing with uh, Samuel Snow's son. All of these things have come together to show us a picture of something. But we don't see the picture yet. We just know that it's there. It's like putting together a puzzle when you don't have the box with the picture on the box. You can kind of guess at what it's going to look like, but you're not really sure. Yep. Okay. So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful uh, for the things you show us. And we ask, Lord, that you can teach us, that we can yield to you, that we can trust in you. Be with each person, you know, the, the trials that we face each day. And um, we ask, Lord, that um, your angels can watch over us and that you can help us to reflect your character as we go about our day. And we pray that you can bring us together again to study your word. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Recording.